So here we are, you know what a rational function looks like now. But I want to show you what the graphs look like. The graphs of typical rational functions. Like this. Or like that. Or like this, which is pretty much like the first one. And we're going to look at why they look like this instead of what we what we we could call normal graphs. Normal graphs are the ones we're more familiar with, which are the graphs of polynomials. These are rational functions. They're not polynomials. In fact, they can best be described as a polynomial over a polynomial. And that's more visible here. That's a little linear binomial polynomial and a linear binomial polynomial. You've got one of them in the numerator, one of them in the denominator. OK, let's get to work. The first thing we're being asked to do is find the domain, and you have been doing that now since the beginning of the semester, finding the domain of a rational function, something that looks like this. And so you know only too well by now that what you do is you take the denominator, let me make this a tad bigger, you take the denominator and you set it equal to zero. And then you factor it, we have to factor that, and you find out what the x's are that will make the denominator equal zero, because those are the values of x that will make the rational function undefined. We have to get them out, 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 out. Okay, so let's do that. x squared plus 2x minus 35 equals 0, which is what we don't want to have happen. All right, I'm going to factor this. There's a 1 in front of the x squared, so I can separate the x's, x times x is x squared, and then take negative 35 and factor that into two numbers that will add up to two. Well, I know that positive 35 equals one times 35 and five times seven, and really not much else. But I know that 7 minus 5 would be 2. So that's hopeful. Now, we're not dealing with positive 35. We're dealing with negative 35. And so negative 35, all negative numbers, equal a positive number times a negative number, or a negative number times a positive number. And so if I choose negative 5, times positive 7, then when I add them together, I get positive 2, which is the number I want. So I know I'm going to use negative 5 and positive 7. set each factor equal to zero, and I solve each little equation. So I get x equals 5, minus 7, minus 7. I 
So to mark through those. X equals negative seven. These are the two numbers that I have to take out of the domain, okay? Because X cannot be allowed to equal five. And X cannot be allowed to equal negative seven. So I'm going to put these on the x-axis. I'm just going to draw a quick little x-axis so I can see where they are. Negative five. No, that's positive five. No, no, no. Positive five. Okay. Um, um, negative seven and positive five. And then I'm going to brutally take them off the x-axis. So now I have two holes in my x-axis where I took these numbers out. So all of the other numbers are going to be okay from negative infinity to the left side of negative seven, from the right side of, of negative seven to the left side of five, and from the right side of five to positive infinity. And so my domain is going to be negative infinity to negative seven, that interval of numbers unioned up with the interval of numbers between negative seven and positive five, unioned up with the interval of numbers between five and positive infinity. So that's our domain. That means we can choose any numbers for X from here or from here or from here, just not these. So now for some of you, this will be new. Asymptotes. Asymptotes are limits or tendencies, but this guy is an absolute limit Vertical asymptotes, vertical, I meant to be pointing at that. Vertical asymptotes are very hardcore. They're like walls. And I'll show you what they do. Right here. Vertical asymptotes. I'm going to make these dark violet. Vertical asymptotes act like walls. Whoa. Those are big. Let's make them a mm, little smaller. Okay. No. They can be hard to, to draw when you don't have a grid. That's better, okay. They're vertical lines. That's why they're called vertical asymptotes. And they act like walls between the parts of the graph. The equation of this vertical asymptote that needs to be smaller. The equation of this vertical asymptote is x equals negative seven, and the equation of this vertical asymptote is x equals five. 
and I'll have to get those colors in sync or we'll throw up. You can think of them as walls though. Let me show you what would happen. You see, this is what the graph wants to do if the graph had its own mind. It wants to be coming in from negative infinity. It's tired after a long work day and it wants to just do that. But at this point, x equals negative seven. In whatever that point is, x is negative seven. And that means very bad things. We can't have that because then the rational function will be undefined. So, the graph is never, never, never going to cross a vertical asymptote. So let me erase that. There. That, that makes sure that X will never equal negative seven or positive five. No, Mr. Rademacher? Yes. yes. Sorry. So ideally our asymptotes are just the numbers that are not on the x-axis? That's correct. Okay. There is a little more complication to it, but I'm trying to keep that out of this class so that only the people who go on will meet that extra little complication. Yeah, well, I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. Good, anybody else have a question? I wanna change this color, I can't stand it. There. It won't change that, but it'll change the ones in the future. Um, okay, so now that we've built our walls, we also have to build something that's a little softer, the floor if you will, the floor for part of it, the ceiling for part of it. Um, it's easier if I show you, but first let me write down the equations of the vertical asymptotes. The equations of the vertical asymptotes. Remember we factored this, we said X minus five and X plus seven equal to zero and we ended up with these equations. Those are the equations of the vertical asymptotes. So X, ooh, X equals five and X equals negative seven. And that, that comes from there. And this comes from here. Make that skinnier. We'll make everything perfect eventually. Okay. We also have a horizontal asymptote. Now, let me show you where it is here, and then I'll explain why. The horizontal asymptote is a limit. It's a tendency. It's where the graph tends to go way out here on the left. Except I want a different color. I almost always make the horizontal um, asymptote in blue. Why? Because I do. Okay, way out here, this line. the line that the graph gets closer to way out here on the left and way out here on the right. It's always horizontal, which is, well, we're only dealing with the horizontal ones in this class. Now, of course, I just can't have two little separate line segments there. Uh, this line for this particular graph 
is the x-axis. It's not always the x-axis, but for this graph it is. And together, the vertical asymptotes and the horizontal asymptote create a kind of a, um, a frame for the graph. Part of the graph occurs here, part of the graph occurs here, part of the graph occurs there. Got to make it a little skinnier here. Fine. Let's try this again. Now in here, the graph is allowed to cross the horizontal asymptote, never the vertical asymptotes, but once in a while it'll cross the horizontal asymptote in here, but not way out here and not way out here. So even though that looks like it's touching, it's not. It's just getting really, really close to. The graph is getting really, really close to, but not touching the horizontal asymptote way out here on the left and way out here on the right. And it is allowed to cross the horizontal asymptote in here. And it does sometimes. Not here though, as you'll see. So let us draw our asymptotes on here. Negative seven, no, is it negative seven? Yes, negative seven and positive five. So negative seven is right there, okay. And positive five. No, too far over. There. Oh. And horizontal asymptote, that is going to be thick. Oh, it's not too bad. Okay. And this is x equals negative 7 x equals 5, and the equation of the x-axis, the x, um, yeah, the x-axis is really just a horizontal line, all right, it's a very important horizontal line, but it's a horizontal line, so, so it has its own equation, and now's the time to learn it, it is y, uh, let me make it bigger again, y equals zero. That's the name of the x-axis. And indeed, every point on the x-axis has y equals zero, because y does equal zero on the x-axis. While we're at it, the y-axis does have its own um, uh, its own equation, and that is x equals zero, because x equals zero on the y-axis. It's just a vertical line, an important vertical line, but it's a vertical line. So it has equations like other vertical lines. And the horizontal, well, the x-axis, which is horizontal, has its own uh, equation, which is the equation of all horizontal lines. Y equals a number. 
Okay. There. So here's a rule and here's how I know that that's true. Look up here. This is a constant. What color should I use? How about black? This is a constant. And this is a quadratic trinomial. The part about it being quadratic is all that really matters here. Constants all have degree zero. And quadratics all have degree two. Okay, so what? Aha! In this particular graph, well, in this particular function, we have degree zero over degree two. And what this means is that the degree of the numerator is lower than or is less than the degree of the denominator. Here's the rule. When you have this situation, the situation being that the degree of the numerator is lower than, is less than the degree of the denominator, the x-axis is always automatically the horizontal asymptote. And nobody wants to have to write horizontal asymptote even once, much less over and over again. So most of the time you're going to see this. Ha! Horizontal asymptote. And for vertical asymptotes, which are also a pain to write, you will see va. Or I should go like this, va. So you've got va and ha. And that saves your hand. There are gonna be two rules about horizontal asymptotes that you have to memorize. Okay, like most graphs, you have to look for the x-intercepts and the y-intercepts. So there, this is how you find the x-intercepts of a rational 
function, a fraction. Hello, George. Set the numerator. Just the numerator. Equal to zero. And solve for the variable. If there's no variable, there's no x-intercept. Guess what? You can't say one equals zero, that's stupid. One equals one and zero equals zero. There's no x there to solve for. If there's no variable, well, there's no x-intercept. You don't have to have an x-intercept? No. So the graph will not cross the x-axis, ever. That's what that means. Are there other rational functions that do have x-intercepts? Yes, or we wouldn't bother to look. Okay, now we are going to find the y-intercept. So I'm going to write this again, f of x equals 1 over x squared plus 2x minus 35. Because here is how you always find the y-intercept even if you're not uh, working with a function. Well, you wouldn't have f of x if you weren't dealing with a function. But other than that, what you do to find the y-intercept is you set all the x's equal to zero. So we'll have zero squared plus two times zero minus 35. And that gives us 1 over negative 35, which my math lab won't like. So, the y-intercept is just a point on the y-axis, so write it like a point. A point on the y-axis is going to put negative 1 over 35 here, and zero there, because x is zero on the y-axis. This is your x-intercept. Now let's look at what that really equals. Negative one divided by 35. That is a really small number. It's almost zero. Y equals zero. The x-axis. But it can't, of course, be the x-axis because we don't have an x-intercept. And that is not exactly equal to zero. It's just almost zero. So it ends up that that is not touching the x-axis. 
and the y-intercept is going to be so close to the x-axis, it looks like it's touching the x-axis, but it's not. And it's a negative number, so it'll be underneath the x-axis. Well, now we know everything we need to know to go ahead and graph this function. We've got our x, x, uh, <clears throat> we've got our horizontal asymptote, we've got our vertical asymptotes, and we have, well, we don't have an x intercept, but we do have a y intercept. So now comes the hard part for me. You know how talented I am at graphing. Yes. All right, here we go. I hate this. This is the hard part right here. That's not touching, just looks like it is. It's also almost impossible to draw these so that they're getting closer and closer and closer to the intercept. I should have drawn this over there, even though this is closer to the intercept. I mean, to the uh, uh, vertical asymptote. But shoot. There. No, I just want to get rid of that. There. All right, that's the hard part. As you can see, it's impossible to draw these exactly. And on the outside, we're going to have. This is a little bit easier, but not. Much. Oh. And that's the best I can do. All right, so we're going to do this again. You, so you're going to see that you follow the same steps. Let's do this. And this gives me a wonderful opportunity to show you how to graph these on your graphing calculator. Notice there are two terms on the top, it's a binomial. Two terms on the bottom, it's a binomial. Whenever you have more than one term, you have to use parentheses. So the way I would graph this is I would hit a paren, 3x minus 5 divided by parenthesis, 3x plus 21. Okay. Now this part of the graph isn't great. So, um, what I did was I changed the window a little bit. Um, I left this the way it is because we have that little um, sliver of the graph out here, so I can't bring the left side in very much, but I can bring the right side in. 
So what if I were to make X max the far right limit to what you can see? What if I were to make that positive three? You have to play around with these to be able to see them. Obviously that doesn't work. So what I did was I had to play around with this. The window is how you set the far left uh, limit to, your, to the screen, the far right limit to the screen, the bottom limit to the screen, the upper limit to the screen. This will force you to get to know your window. But I finally, I, I finally was able to get this. I wanted to see the x-intercept. You see there's an x-intercept here, and there's a y-intercept. There's a y-intercept right here. There's an x-intercept right there. So we're gonna be finding those. And of course, we're gonna find our intercepts, and we're gonna find our domain. So let us get to work. To determine the domain, we, uh, we set the denominator equal to zero and solve for x. Subtract 21, subtract 21. 3x, see how much that looks like a z? You need to either put a line, well, if it's a Z, you put a line through it. But also I need to be more careful and make this obviously not a Z. 3X equals negative 21. We divide by three, we divide by three. X equals negative seven. This, by the way, is also the equation of our vertical asymptote. But going back to the domain, it's not enough just to write that. We have to say, okay, X cannot equal negative seven. And then we have to write it in interval notation, usually, interval notation, and that's what you're asked for here. Oh, this is white. Yeah, it is white. Okay, good. We're going to make negative seven disappear from the x-axis. Then, let's see, we've got infinity out here, negative infinity out here. All of these numbers are okay. And all of these numbers are OK. Negative. Here's where your vertical asymptote will be. And we're very happy. OK, let's go ahead and draw the vertical asymptote. We have one vertical asymptote. Notice you have two parts to the graph and your vertical asymptote is gonna be at negative one, negative two, negative three, negative four, negative five, negative six, <gasps> negative seven. Okay. So, negative seven. And negative seven. And that divides really, really the screen and the graph into however many parts of the graph there are going to be. It's kind of nice when you only have one. Oh, let's do it here too. What is it? Negative seven. Negative seven. Yes, yes. Again negative seven. Not very creative of the My Math Lab people. 
Stop being critical, Barbara. I'm not all that creative either. Negative seven. And I, I took two programming courses when I was in college and then another one afterwards. They're languages that nobody uses now, but they did. And um, uh, it was really difficult. Well, of course, I only took beginning courses. So while I found them difficult, I could do them. But the really hard stuff, trying to imagine every little thing that could happen, it's impossible. That's why computers give us trouble. OK, we have a horizontal asymptote. Let's look at this. The degree of this highest degree variable is one. When you don't see a power, the power is one. So here the numerator is degree one. The denominator is degree one. Up here, the degree of the numerator was lower than the degree of the denominator, but here the two degrees are equal. What do you do then? Well, when, when the degrees of the numerator, and I'm just going to say num, and denominator, denom, are equal, okay, this is going to be a mouthful, but then I'll show you what I mean. The ha, 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 ha. I can't resist. The ha is the ratio ratio means fraction. The ha is the ratio of the leading terms of the leading coefficients. of the num of the numerator two gotta use a two there to the denom denominator that two is in a very important position when you're talking about a ratio that's the fraction bar what comes before the word two is the numerator, and what comes after the word two is the denominator. Now what this means for us, this is the leading coefficient of the numerator. This is the leading coefficient of the denominator. So our horizontal asymptote is going to be y, ah, let me make it in blue, because that's what I usually do, and that way it'll stand out from this writing. y equals, because all horizontal lines are y equals, y equals the leading coefficient of the numerator over the leading coefficient of the denominator so we'll have three over three, and of course, three over three is one. Oh, 
but we'll put a little tail on it like that. I'm still practicing. Um, okay, so y equals one. It's not the x-axis this time. So here's y equals one. And there is our horizontal asymptote. And this is the line y equals one. Just like this was the line y equals zero. All right, we have our frame now. There's gonna be something over here and something over here. And I know that cause I, I checked. All right, now that we have our asymptotes, we have our frame for the graph. We're going to find the x-intercept and the y-intercept. And now we have, uh, we can do this, 3x minus 5 equals 0. You take the numerator and set it equal to 0. So let me write that down. This is going to be num equals zero. So that'll be 3x minus 5 It's the numerator I'm doing this to. Only the numerator gives you your x-intercepts when you're working with rational functions. I'll add five to both sides. So three X, let me write it over here. Three X equals five. And then I'll divide by three and divide by three. So I'll have X equals five thirds. And since the x-intercept is a point on the x-axis, I write it as a point. Five-thirds is in the x position. And on the x-axis, y always equals zero. So this is my x-intercept. Let's go put it on the graph. x-intercept, five-thirds. Don't write it this way. We, we don't do this in algebra, but just so I know, five thirds is one and two thirds. So here, here's one, here's two, one and two thirds of the way to two, Let's estimate it right here. See, this isn't exact. It's just to give me a visual idea of what the graph looks like in a fairly accurate way. Okay, now back. Now we're going to find the y-intercept. So let me write it in English. Um, set all the x's equal to zero. So we're going to have f of x. I need to copy down f of x f of x equals 3x minus 5 over 3x plus 21. 
So f of zero will be three times zero minus five over three times zero plus 21. Well, three times zero is zero, three times zero is zero. Zero minus five is negative five. Um, zero plus 21 is 21. Now, leaving the um, the doohickey, the negative sign, up by the five is fine with my math lab. Or pull it, putting it out front. Whatever. That's going to be your y-intercept. Now stop and think. This is a point, so you have to write it as a point, which means it has to have parentheses, has to have an x-coordinate and a y-coordinate. Well, your x-coordinate is zero. You just set all your zero, your x's equal to zero. The number you got, the number you calculated, when you set all your x's equal to zero, is negative five over 21. Let's find out what that number is, or we can just estimate it. I know that negative five over 20 is negative one fourth. Well, this is 21. So the number for that, that I would get in a calculator would be about negative one fourth. Be really close. Not exact, but close. So I am just going to come down here to negative one fourth, which is one fourth of the way to one. It's about right there. And I'm going to say that's that's about the y intercept. And now I'm ready to graph. First, we know from the graph we got in the graphing calculator that this this guy, I mean, it's up here like that. This is the hard one. <sighs> OK, we're going to have to draw this in pieces. It doesn't wiggle. So pretend that wiggle is not there. Or do something like that. So now let's pull out and take a look at our work of art, which looks eh, close enough, close enough to this. And that's what the graph looks like. Roughly speaking. Now it ends up the horizontal asymptote in real life is very, very important. You've got two word problems at the end and I wanna make sure I've got time to do those for you. So we're gonna skip the last problem, which is just more of the same. And it's not in your homework anyway. These two are. But let's do this. These look horribly terrifying and that might prevent you from even trying to do it. So this is where taking a deep breath and realizing that other people have survived this problem. This problem is aimed at everyone who has a, a, a medical major in mind like nursing or EMT 
or um, what is that called? Somebody who helps you breathe. Yeah, um, one of those. So we have lots and lots of medical majors here. Uh, this this would be something that you would have to deal with, and it's even a little scary. All right, this function right here, this ugly looking function, which really, if you take a deep breath, it's just got a numerator and a denominator. T is acting like X. And here we're being told that T starts at 15 on the X axis, if you were graphing it. T starts at 15. And then we find out what this stuff means. All right, so this function gives the body concentration, which is this, this is the body concentration, the concentration of a drug in the body. My body, your body. Gives the body concentration in parts per million you don't really have to know that. Of a certain dosage of medication after time T in hours. So you read that a few times and you realize that what it's saying is that this function, 0.9 T, let me make it bigger, 0 0.9 T plus 800 over 5 T plus 8. This gives the concentration of a medication in your body. That's all we're talking about. How much drug is in your bod? Concentration of medication. In your body. after a certain number of hours Starting at 15 hours. Why 15? I haven't the slightest idea. If you were a medical researcher, like people working on the COVID vaccine, um, you would have to document everything in including the number of hours you're starting with. OK, so for instance, um, after 15 hours, you would just put 15 in for T and calculate the answer. After 16 hours, you would put uh, that amount of time in for T. And calculate the answer. That's all this is. And then we get to A. What does N of T, that is, what does this approach as T goes to infinity? What is A saying to us? 
This is math talk right here. Well, forget the math talk. We need to put it in English so you can do the problem. What this is asking is, what is the concentration? And this would help you tremendously if you would sit down and try to write this in your own language, in your own everyday language. Um, what is the concentration? That is, that is, well, the concentration. I don't know another word for concentration. What is the concentration of the drug in your body? after a whole bunch of hours, seriously. Now you might not want to say a whole bunch, but that's what it's saying, after a whole bunch of hours. So that's like, after two days, three days, four days, five days, six days, how much of that drug is going to be left in your body? I, so I should put a question mark. For that, we have to find the horizontal asymptote. So let's Analyze this, 0 0.9 T plus 800 over 5 T plus 8. To find the ha, you have to look at the degree of the top and the bottom. Degree of num and denom are equal. Degrees, yes, uh, are equal. So, this is what we're going to do. We're going to take the leading coefficient of the numerator and divide it by the leading coefficient of the denominator. And this is going to give us the parts per million. Yes, and I did this. Was that silly of me or what? Didn't even think about it. Shutting it down. All right. Point nine divided by five. Point eighteen. the concentration in your body is going to be 0.18 parts per million, parts per million, or whatever they call it. The important thing to notice here, explain the meaning of the answer up here in part A that we just found in terms of application. Now, what the heck does that mean? Well, what they do is they give you four possible answers. And you choose the one that's closest to the truth. And the one that's closest to the truth 
is that the concentration of the drug in your body is never going to go back to zero. The concentration of the drug, of the medication in your body, in your bod, in your body, will never go back to zero. Well, that could be good or bad. but it's still kind of scary. So this, this really is how you do word problems. You translate them into your own language and you don't have to use fancy words. Translate them for yourself into the words you use. And if you have to, use a dictionary. Now, real fast, before we leave, this was aimed at medical majors. The next problem is aimed at hospitality majors. We have a great hospitality major here. And now that people are going to start traveling more, not now, but in the near future, going to be lots of jobs in the hospitality sector of the economy. Because people are going to make up for lost time. Get me out of the house. Take me to Yellowstone Park. I've been there so beautiful. And I love the beers. What can I say? But don't feed the bears because they might take your hand off with it, with the food. Okay, let's read this and talk about it, and I will do it for the video, but uh, after we talk about it, you are free to go. I just wanna help explain what it means. All right, hospitality majors, you, you are the manager of a resort. And this function right here tells you about how many people you're going to have in your resort after T months, where T means months. And then what you do for part A is you let t equal zero, you let t equal one, you let t equal three, you let t equal eight. So the population after one month, let's just do one. Well, let's do zero. The population at the beginning in math, when we use zero, it means in the beginning, at least in this context. Four times zero squared, plus nine, after zero months, and uh, P of one will be 500 times one, over four times one squared, plus nine, and you keep going like that. Next time you do it with three, next time you do it with eight, and the answer box tells you how many places to round to. Oh, and this is very important. The answer you get will be in thousands. So before you put the answer in the answer box, you have to multiply by a thousand unless they say how many thousands. So pay attention to that. 
Now it says find the horizontal asymptote of the graph and determine the value of, of this function, P of T, as it approaches infinity. So what you as the manager wanna do is, you wanna have your accountant. Yes, I need to move this up so you can see. So let me plug in a page real fast. Okay. There now. You want to know what the asymptote is because you not want to know what the tendency is of your population. You're going to care about the future as well as the present. As a, as a manager, you've got to care about everything. So you look at, well, you don't, your accountant does, but you better double check your accountant or you will find out that your company is broke. So if you already know how to do this stuff, you'll be considered a bargain employee by the conglomerate, the big company, that owns your resort. 500T over 4T squared plus nine. Okay, our numerator has degree one. Our denominator has degree two. The degree of the numerator is lower than the degree of the denominator, so our horizontal asymptote is automatically um, uh, the x-axis. which is y equals zero. So let me point out to you something you already know, which is that this f of x or p of t, they're just very fancy technical ways of writing y. They equal y, they're just y. So what this says is that after a lot of months, this would be the answer to B, but C, the translation is that after a lot of months, you're not gonna have any people in your resort. No guests. After a lot of months. Well, you know that it's a resort particularly in my favorite place, which is Yellowstone. Um, I haven't gone back. That's a pity. I should go back. It's the most, you see, I'm afraid I would never come back if I went out there. It is incredibly gorgeous. And then you go to Mount Teton, which is actually near there, and you look at all the prairie dogs and the mount. It's wonderful. Anyway, I guarantee that after a few months, because it's high in the mountains, it's cold. By October, they have shut it down and even shut down some of the roads because of icing. So, of course, you're not going to have any guests after a few months. Much less a lot of months. So there are gonna be no guests after a lot of months. No guests after a lot of months. Now that's not mathematical ease. That's just plain old English.
And that's all that means, and that's all you have to do. So your first look at these is, oh my God, that's horrible, I could never do that. But I promise you, if you just calm down, take a breath, rewrite the problem in, in just normal everyday English. That's called colloquial English. See, there's always a way to make it fancy. Um, then you can you can do the problem because they're not asking you to do anything we you haven't you haven't done here. And to find the horizontal asymptote, you've only got those two rules right now in this class. So that's it, gang. I actually did the problem for you. Questions about all this? It's not as hard as it looks. Nowhere near. Okay, well, it's now 847. In 13 minutes, I'm going to be heading over to um, my help time link, which is in your canvas, and I'll be there until 1015. And remember that just by coming by to say hello, you don't have to ask me anything, but you could. Just by coming by to say hello, I will give you five points extra credit. That can't hurt going into the next test. So hang around if you have questions. If not, maybe I'll see you in 13 minutes or an hour. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.